All right, it's another 1800, and we are starting the recording. So thank you for joining in either in person or coming back and watching these uh, webinar series. This week is developing and training, or developing training and exercise plans. This is the first session of this series in our webinar. And let me share my screen. There we go. All right, you should be able to see the slides now. Um, hopefully you, you uh, can hear me. Can you give me a thumbs up if you can hear me? All right, so it sounds good. All right, so uh, again, uh, thank you for, for joining the emergency services uh professional development uh webinars as i said before this series is on developing and training in uh, exercise plans there you go this is a four-week series um our topics that we're going to cover during uh the four weeks uh, of this series um for this week is going to be overview and intent the next session will be training design the third session will be exercise design and then finally we'll wrap up with evaluations and after action reports so this week overview and intent here's some of the topics that we're going to discuss today uh, changing language uh, within the units and ultimately we need to probably recommend uh, changing the language uh, throughout the Civil Air Patrol, um, and we'll get more into that. We're going to talk about mission-focused training. Um, our our self-claim as professional volunteers and what, what that means. And then we're going to talk about mission essential task list. This is not a common term known by uh, many within our organization. Um, but it is a common term with our DOD and Homeland Security and FEMA partners. So we'll go into uh, that a little bit. So this uh, diagram here is actually taken from the Homeland Security Exercise and Evaluation Program. It's a program management life cycle and exercise and training falls within a program. And so, Within emergency services, we have our own training uh, program, training and evaluation program, and so do all the other specialties out there. Um, and it all starts with a, a plan, and then you have to design, you know, design and develop your plan and your training and exercise events. You have to conduct the training or conduct the exercise, conduct the evaluations, and then that feedback from the evaluations is going to go back into improvement of your training cycle and your exercise cycles and uh, i'll get into why uh, i keep breaking those out separately in the upcoming slides but it's it never ends so every step that you take through the process is directly leading to the next and all of your feedback and all of your performance goes back into to planning to start the cycle over again. So changing the language within units. This is a big, big issue. So often we hear we're going to have a SARX. We're going to have whatever type of exercise, a training. Um, or we're going to do training this weekend. Training is skill based. So, how to paint a car, you know, how to screw in a light bulb, those are skill based things. And our training and skills come from our uh, SQTRs. Training is also broken down to teaching and instructing or um, on the my civilian uh, education side, I consider it as uh, 
training and education. So I, I can train a monkey to use a hammer to hammer a nail in a piece of wood. He doesn't know why he's hammering that nail into a piece of wood. He just knows that I need to hammer this nail into the piece of wood. Uh, that's training. Education is understanding the concepts, understanding the theory, understanding the primary, secondary, and tertiary effects of the tasks that you perform in relation to the broader team function or the broader mission. So when uh, here, when we're talking teaching and instructing, teaching is that educational piece. We need to explain the why and the effects of the skills uh, that we are then instructing the actual steps to our members and how th by them performing a particular skill is going to affect the, the overall mission accomplishment. How's it going to affect the team? How's it going to affect if they do it poorly? And how is it going to affect them if they do it correctly or in a, a proficient uh, manner to the standards that we set? And then all of the training is should be focused at individual and small teams. So that's training a single individual through the, you know, the SQTRs to perform basic level tasks and then how that integrates with directly with, you know, their team. So if we're looking at air crew, you know, how is the mission pilots uh, actual flight patterns going to affect the the job that the scanner is trying to do or uh, the aerial photographer is trying to perform and how is the proficiency of a mission observer going to affect the pilot or the scanner and the same on the ground team how you know if you don't know how to operate your udf equipment how is that going to affect the overall elt search that the ground team is trying to perform um, so training is small in nature, specific tasks with some very specific evaluations to a, a, a particular standard for that individual task. Now an exercise is scenario based. And the purpose is to evaluate performance and related to uh, those mission essential tasks that we'll talk about later. Exercises are focused on team and unit performance. So the overall air crew's ability to conduct a search, uh, the ground team's overall ability to conduct a wilderness search and rescue mission or a wide area search or support uh, urban SAR or run a point of distribution uh, facility. This is also Evaluating like an incident management team or the, your incident command staff. Can the air operations branch director and ground branch director effectively communicate and coordinate their aspects of the mission uh, with the planning chief, with the op operations section chief, uh, with the incident commander, uh, as well as deconflicting uh, tasks, assigned tasks and objectives uh, between you know, the ground team and the air crew. So an exercise, you show up with your team and you're given a scenario and you go. Nobody's doing any instructing. Nobody's walking you through the steps. You show up to perform as if it's a real mission. And there has to be assigned and trained evaluators present. And they do not interfere. They do, they do not step in. They don't give you guidance uh, unless you are blatantly uh, disregarding, you know, safety protocols and they'll, they'll step in for a safety purpose, but they are given evaluation sheets and evaluation criteria. And that's, th they're collecting data. And then at the end, they're going to do an after action report and a hot wash with all the sections and identify areas that you performed exceptionally well in areas that you're just eh, proficient at, you know, good. You did the, you know, the bare minimum to the standard and then the areas that need improvement. And then their feedback is going to be used to dictate the upcoming training cycles and then the upcoming exercise cycles to come back and reevaluate. Did we correct our training program to 
address the deficiencies that we have and then did did we effectively address those efficient uh, deficiencies and perform the skills to acceptable uh, standard so this last bullet here it's going to be a culture shock and it is i, I i'm in this argument often with people uh, within our organization about you know a gsar exer or a ground search and rescue exercise is not coming to you know get people signed off a gtm3 gtm2 gtm1 uh, basic task um, yes there will be some events within the exercise that we can say yes we evaluated their performance and yes they will sign off on the task but we shouldn't be walking them through the steps there should be no training going on at the time now if we set up a, a SAR college or a training event that is the time and place to be doing those periods of instruction but if we if we say we're going to hold a, a a SARX search and rescue exercise it needs to be scenario based all of your teams all the assets need to be alerted called out deployed as if it was a real mission uh, an air force or a c mission uh, directed by the wing uh, to support the state and they need to just show up and execute as if it was a real mission and then retrograde back home as if it was a real mission and then do the overall evaluation on on their performance a mission focused it, we're not uh, nowhere in here am i recommending that we move away from the sqtrs again the sqtrs are our are, are basic skill uh, and training requirements so we have to get good at the basics our members need to be highly efficient at those basics and understand why they need to do that uh, to perform those tasks to the specific standards but we also need to look at unit and team capabilities um, these take uh, these capabilities can be flexible or can be fixed so we could potentially build uh, you know senior member based ground teams that are gtm3 through gtm1 certified most of them have ground team leader certifications they went through the virginia department of emergency management sar team member and sar team leader certification courses they've worked and uh, through and completed the national association for search and rescue uh, uh, sar technician uh, two and one ratings and we can identify them as our like premier search and wilderness search and rescue team that can get called out for missions that would be like, like a fixed mission flexible is maybe our uas teams uh, there's tons of missions that they can perform from directly supporting a ground team on a search and rescue to damage assessment missions mapping um, critical infrastructure inspections but once they identify what those missions are they need to develop their training and exercise plans to address uh, those missions and they need to be they should be flexible at performing being able to jump from one mission to the other or being able to change their their mission uh their mission objectives during the mission so say a uas team or a wilderness sar team goes out expecting to perform one mission and all of a sudden uh halfway through it goes from a wilderness sar to a wide area search um, or it goes from a mapping mission with uas's um, to supporting local emergency management emergency response personnel is trying to identify uh, you know collapsed buildings um that have personnel in them or uh, fires uh, hot spots amber spots within a building that a fire department has um, doused already to verify that the fire department can leave that building or maybe the ambers the heat level inside the building is so high which increases the probability of a reignition of the fire so they have to be able to flex be trained and efficient enough 
to be able to turn off one mission objective, pick up the next mission objective as long as it falls within their um, mission capability in which CAP authorizes them to be deployed in. We also need to look at common missions for wings. So who is our common customer? So not every wing is similar. Uh, so Virginia wing is not gonna have the same exact customers or have the same state support as maybe New Mexico wing. There could be complete, like New Mexico isn't going to be doing, you know, hurricane relief missions. Um, Virginia may not have to deal with drought missions, supporting point of distributions for, you know, droughts or something. Um, each wing may have a different mission. And so that requires the leadership to become more engaged uh, with the state level, you know, maybe FEMA region, FEMA, uh, FEMA region uh, leadership, our, re our CAP region leadership, identify those possible missions that we are more likely to participate in. And then that's where we get the guidance from our higher headquarters that will direct us on the, the missions that we're going to perform. So if you're in a state that you're just not going to do wilderness search and rescue, sort of like, you know, in the Midwest where everything's just flat, you know, ground teams probably don't need to train as proficiently in wilderness search and rescue, but maybe they need to focus on community emergency response team requirements point of distribution requirements, shelter uh, support, other areas which their wing may get activated to support and how a ground team then can be effectively used. And th this goes across, you know, all of our emergency services uh, capabilities. And then we need to look at high impact, low probability. And, and th a quadrant analysis is a falls within critical thinking and uh, in the intel community we call this a structured analytical technique uh, so it has you know structure to it. it it's a defined way that you analyze something um, to help bring out our known knowns and our our known unknowns and hopefully identify our unknown unknowns um, but ultimately what you do you break down uh, a quadrant so you have four corners or you know four quadrants and you label them high impact high probability high impact low probability low impact uh, high probability and low impact low probability and then you identify all those types of missions in which you are going to get deployed for and put them in those uh, different quadrants so low impact, low probability, those are things you really don't have to worry about too much because they have very little impact on your mission, on your unit, on your funding, on your training cycle, because they also um, are, are low probability of occurring. So if they do occur, it, it, it's not as a big deal. The high probability, low impact are our day-to-day missions that we're doing so like around here a high probability low impact is our usually our elt searches i, I would classify that because they're usually um you know almost once a month if not more they're usually on an airfield it's you know a maintenance um mistake or a hard landing mistake at it's a high probability that it's going to happen, but it's very low impact. You know, we can we can get people to an airport and do a runway search or do a hangar search. It's not going to take uh, a large amount of effort, a large amount of time, uh, not a lot of man hours usually uh, to accomplish those missions. But things that we have to worry about are the high impact, low probability occurrences. These are the things that that catch all emergency response organizations uh, off guard. And they are the ones that really take us from being effective to ineffective because we don't know how to adapt. 
uh, or we we haven't trained for them. So a high impact, low probability event is uh, something like the re- the massive ice storm that moved, snow and ice storm that moved through Virginia that you know shut down and stranded people on I ninety five. It dumped you know two feet of snow in some areas here. The, that was a very low probability that, you know, we don't get storms like that often, but it definitely had a high impact, uh, not just on Civil Air Patrol, but the whole state of Virginia and in other states, the National Capital Region, uh, North Carolina, because I-95 was shut down. So that, you know, I-95 being a main uh, line of communication for our logistics in our country, uh, huge, huge impact. Uh, terrorist attacks. So 9-11, the um, Twin Tower bombing er- earlier in the 90s where they blew up a uh, truck in the basement. The um, What are some of the other ones? The, the Boston Marathon event. The, these are all high impact, low probability. You know, terrorist attack on U.S. soil is a low probability event but it definitely has a high impact. It's very high visible and has a mass effect. So like on 9-11, and people forget about this um, because it, it's, you know, been so long ago for, for some people or nobody or p- people that are now a part of emergency response or emergency services, uh, they were not during that time, but communications was, was depleted completely like cell phone internet i mean it 9-11 especially in this area just it it was devastating on just our communications infrastructure even i was in okinawa uh, japan when 9-11 hit and we couldn't call from japan back to the u.s to you know check on family members so it had a worldwide impact uh, this is one of those high impact, low probability events that CAP could definitely step up and train for is what happens if the national capital region was attacked again and we needed to stand up a wing wide uh, communications capability to support um, the Homeland Security and Department of Defense and everybody else. Um, people say, well, yeah, it's not going to really happen again, but. OK. Yeah, that that's the low probability aspect of it, but the high impact, and that if that's going to be a time for civil air patrol to step up uh, and perform the the one of the mission sets that we advertise this backup communications, this robust communications network, we need to be able to perform to that. So we have to develop training and exercises uh, to address those high impact, low probability situations where if we can't perform it's going to have an even bigger impact, not just on the mission, but on the future of Civil Air Patrol. Now, this gets into um, the professional volunteers. So Civil Air Patrol is an organization full of professional volunteers. We have our specialty tracks. We have our emergency services qualification uh, programs that we professionalize our volunteers. We train basic skills, we train advanced skills, uh, we give experience, but we need to take this further. It, if somebody is going to step up in the role uh, to perform as an emergency services officer or decide to take on an emergency services qualification, uh, we need to be technically and tactically proficient. And this will be familiar if you join in for the leadership development series um that that we're doing as well that's a 12 week uh, series uh, this is one of our key leadership principles right here is to be technically and tactically proficient so can are you good at the are you an expert at the basics uh, are you really good or an expert at those advanced skills and are you able to perform those under stressful environments and within a team organization or a team function, supporting a crew, uh, supporting an incident command staff, being able to work uh, with our uh, partner organizations. To really truly call ourselves professional volunteers, we have to be technically and tactically proficient in the things that we do. 
we have to align our training and evaluation programs uh, with our partners. So the diagram that I showed in the beginning that was taken from our FEMA or Homeland Security Exercise Evaluations Program, you know, which we all can take uh, th that course uh, through FEMA and start learning how, like, take an overview of uh, the program and then learn how to create exercises and how how to create training events and training plans and build mission essential task lists um, and so forth. Also, our D the DOD uses TEEP, uh, which is also the training and evaluation uh, program. Um, depending on what services you have or are associated with, they may have a different word for the E, but overall it's a um, evaluate, uh, exercise evaluation program. We have to be able to show that, yes, we, we have our medals, we have our METs, our mission essential tasks, we are training to them. Here's how we can quantify our training in our proficiency. Uh, here's how we exercise. Here's how we evaluate our exercises. And um, uh, we'll get into it in the slides later. This is how we're continuing to in, uh, evolve our, our program life cycles uh, from these programs. And by becoming professional volunteers and, and going through a training and education evaluation program, we help reduce cost and increase time efficiency. So the more efficient an air crew is at performing their tasks and more efficient they are at communicating, say, with ground teams. And the more efficient the ground teams are at performing their tasks and able to coordinate with the air crew, that means the mission gets accomplished quicker. Or at least the task assigned to those teams gets accomplished quicker. And the quicker their task or mission objectives are accomplished, that's less cost occurred uh, to the agency having jurisdiction or the DOD, whoever's paying uh, for Civil Air Patrol to be supporting that operation. It reduces the cost. It reduces the amount of fuel consumption. It reduces the meals. Uh, uh, reduces time on the equipment, you know, because the more the equipment's used, you're you're taking hours away from its overall life cycle. That that's true for tires, vehicles, aircraft, communications equipment. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. The more technically and tactically proficient we are, we're going to re overall reduce cost, increase our time efficiency, and that circles back where nobody can question that we are professional volunteers. Like it starts building on social capital. And, and social capital is the value that a social structure, group, organization uh, places on an individual or another organization and the value at the, of their presence. What value can you bring to them? Um, and we have to look at adaptability. So if you look at our our handouts, I know I, I'm not dinging Civil Air Patrol on this because it is a volunteer organization. We have limited funds. I, I know the SQTRs are getting ready to go through a review, especially for ground team stuff. Um, but us as members need to take a more proactive role in supporting national headquarters and, and stop in general complaining that, you know, our SQTRs or our hand, handbooks are outdated. Um, we have to take an active role. And if it's something's outdated, we need to write why it's outdated, but give course, you know, improvement, recommended improvements of courses of action, ways to make it better. Like don't complain without a solution, uh, but we all have a voice. So if enough people identified antiquated or outdated policies, outdated, outdated training requirements, if they identified those, formally wrote those up, recommended solutions, uh, ways to correct the issue and send it up, then that's 70 to 80% of the work National Headquarters doesn't have to do. Now they need to review what you wrote, 
okay, does it make sense? Is it within our policies and regulations? Is it in within our uh, core values? Is it within the missions assigned to us by U.S. Air Force? And if so, okay, yeah, let's write up an update. You know, send this through legal review. But if we just sit around and expect national headquarters to do all this stuff on their own, then yeah, it's going to take 10 years to get a policy out. Uh, there's a lot of people that say they know better, but they don't want to write the, write anything up. They, they'll rather verbally complain says it's taking a, you know, the same amount of time that they could have complained about an issue. They could have dictated their complaint to a piece of paper, went back and edited it, found references, um, write, wrote up courses of action, and then routed that through their command. And then they could have said, I've done something about it. Um, and this is adapting uh, and updating our policies to meet adv uh, technological advancements, uh, mission changes. Um, also, it will help advance our, our, our SQTRs. So, like right now, almost every state, if you look at their Department of Emergency Management or their qualifications for search and rescue, a lot of those have like rope requirements. You have to be able to do basic litter stuff. Um, so wilderness first aid and other things that are outside of our standard um, CAPS QTRs for like ground teams. In, until enough people come together and identify, you know, across the, the different wings that, hey, our state has these common requirements and we send all of those up to national headquarters, then we're, we're not going to have a good standard to train to. It, it takes the effort um, from the, it takes a bottom up effort to make the change. But too many people want to put all of the onus on national headquarters and just verbally complain about it. All right, that's enough of that one. So let's talk about mission essential task list. Uh, so some of the purpose of the mission essential tax, uh, task list uh, list, are there a way to, for validating um, data-driven deliverables? I put date, that should be data. I'll go back and change that. So it's a way to quantify or by evaluating based off of metals and training to, you know, metal. It's a way to quantify, yes, we are mission capable because we can verify and certify that our individual members and teams and units have trained to these specific tasks that are directly related to missions that we were told that were essential for our wing or for our region to perform. And they directly relate uh, capabilities to readiness. So if you can show your mission and essential task list and say, yes, these are the capabilities that we can bring to the table. We've evaluated our individuals. They are ready to deploy. We can actually say we have a deployable organization or we have a deployable unit. <clears throat> so they directly relate. And it feed, all that feeds back into what we were talking about a few slides ago about life cycle support and the foundation for your training plan. Everything has a life cycle. Our people have a life cycle. Our, our, our SQTRs have a life cycle. Our radios, vehicles, et cetera, all have a life cycle. A way to support updating, refurbishing, or replacing a, especially a technological um, capability or a piece of equipment is showing that it is out of its life cycle because it can no longer perform or keep up with our, our essential missions and the tasks that we are trying to achieve. Um, so it, it all plays into each other. If you can show that you are outperforming or outpacing the equipment that you're trying to use, and here's our evaluations, here's our exercise evaluations, here's all of our data. That is going to get you newer, newer equipment or more funding a lot quicker than just complaining about it or saying, oh, we've had these radios for 10 years. Well, you know, the, the military had like 
Prick 104s, which were man-packed HF radios, probably for like three decades. They kept performing the, the, the essential tasks of have man-packed HF communications uh, until something came along that could outpace, be more secure, then that piece of equipment stayed. Once we started showing that there was ways to uh, effectively have HF communications and smaller radios, more powerful multi-band radios, then we were able to prove like, hey, this piece of equipment's past its life cycle because I can't sit there with, you know, uh, field wire MRE spoons um, and, and, and a Gerber and sit there and cut an antenna er, for a new frequency every time we wanted to talk to somebody um, because our our terrain keeps uh, kept changing. <clears throat> so that's how all that ties in together. And that was also I, uh, aid in identifying and developing uh, improved standards uh, for personnel. And uh, we just talked about, I, I won't hit the equipment discrepancies because we just talked about that, but also the training standards. Again, going back and showing, hey, we are we're trying to perform a mission that our state wants us to perform based on our SQTRs. They're not up to par with what the state requires uh, as a minimum standard. We need to raise our our personal standards uh, for training. Uh, and that could be like fitness level of our volunteers, you know, which can be an issue. It could be actual skill set. So again, going to like rope work, there, there's none of that in the standard uh, Civil Air Patrol SQTRs for ground teams, but every wilderness organization, uh, search and rescue organization requires their people uh, to d have some basic knot and rope skills. So that right now, the only place you can get that is if somebody brings, say, the Hawk Mountain curriculum and or develops their own curriculum and implements it into a local training event but there's nowhere to capture showing that these individuals have that skill set they meet that standard uh, so that becomes an issue uh, metal is a list of tasks that the unit must accomplish when it's activated it goes back to the name mission essential task list so there's a lot of tasks that you need to be able to perform but the, you're narrowing these down to the most mission essential. So be able to do a wide area search in order to deploy, you have to be able to perform these very specific functions and you have to perform them in a manner that we say is up to standard. The training prepares a unit for deployment. Um, again, it's going back to your mission essential tasks are derived from the unit your higher echelon uh, headquarters. So Virginia Wing may be assigned a particular set of essential tasks that either the state or the Air Force or the region or uh, national headquarters deems are primary functions for Virginia Wing. And then the groups and down will then look at those essential missions and then we should create our mission, mission essential task list based off of those primary missions and the capabilities that we have within our organization. So not everybody's going to have a ground team. Not everybody's going to have a UAS team. But if you do, you need to have medals that are related to your capabilities or the capability that you want to have. So that way you can direct your training and and develop training plans for that. So instead of guessing or reaching out to another unit saying, hey, can you come certify our guys? You can be like, I need somebody to train these very specific tasks. This is what we need on. Okay, we train, we have enough people trained in these skills. We need help uh, putting together an exercise. Here's our exercise evaluation forms. And we'll, this is week four of this series. We'll get more in depth in those. Here's the standards in which we are going to evaluate them. Um, so we want them to evaluate performing these tasks at night or during the day or with certain personal protective equipment associated uh, with no communications. 
um, or reduce comms, or they have to communicate with this organization uh, or this unit in order to success successfully be evaluated at this task. And then the metal is, a, a, again, the unit's primary and most important training management document. By identifying what your mission essential tasks are, like what are the capabilities that you are going to focus your time and resources on, this is going to drive all of your training. This doesn't mean, especially in civil repertoire, where we have members that have interests that are broader than what the unit wants to take on, that's the role of the emergency services officers, be able to reach out to our counterparts and different squadrons and groups and arrange that training. But for the unit specifically, what the unit is going to plan uh, their time, money, and resources around are going to be those mission essential tasks that the higher headquarters says they need to, that, you know, for, for Virginia Wing in this uh, case, what the wing commander says these are our mission essential tasks. If group three selects the UAS and ground team, then we need to make the mission essential task list based on the UAS and ground team functions and build out our training from that. Um, that's just an example. It could, you know, it could be somebody, um, a group, you know, very dispersed, but they want their individuals or the mission they want to take on is being a virtual incident command center and they want to train um, ground branch directors, air branch, uh, air, uh, ground branch directors, uh, air, uh, branch directors, operations section, C planning section, the, you know, your flop section. Then they take those mission essential tasks and, you know, focus and develop their mission essential task list around an incident, incident management team. And then that's how they're going to exercise. That's how they're going to train, uh, to supplement the overall, all, uh, higher headquarters mission. All right. Uh, questions at this time. I, I we don't have a large group here in person, but if you do have questions, you can go ahead and ask. If anybody is watching this at a later point on either Vimeo or YouTube, uh, go ahead, drop your questions in the comments section, and I'm hoping to develop a broader dialogue across Civil Air Patrol, across emergency services, so we can actually. Uh, discuss this. Um, I will put the caveat out, out there again. This is uh, Stephen Littlewood's uh, professional development series uh, for emergency services. This is not backed uh, by the Civil Air Patrol, as in this isn't a formal course. Um, I, I'm bringing in additional information outside of Civil Air Patrol resources uh, to give us a broader look at emergency services. Um, at some of those areas that I feel that we need a little more attention to. So um, don't beat up anybody at national headquarters uh, for anything said here, or don't beat up the Virginia wing. Uh, come yell at me, <laughs> drop comments in. And uh, I, I really hope that this uh, is useful and people, you know, enjoy this and start participating uh, anymore. Uh, so, for our one individual that's here tonight. Do you have any questions or comments? I'm going to take the silence as consent that you have no questions. OK, no questions at this time. All right, it took a little while. All right, so the next um, this uh, topic that we're going to cover in this series, it will be training design. So we're going to look at that, those individual training events. And uh, that course <clears throat> or that webinar will be on September 2nd. Uh, so if you're looking um for following on uh, with this, this particular series. I'll be on September 2nd, and it will get posted that evening. If you're trying to uh, find the registration forms, if you're in Virginia Wing, uh, go ahead and look in Teams. Uh, it's there. You can see all of the courses I have listed and the registration links. Um, if you're watching this later, uh, 
Um, if you have questions, uh, please email or, or leave a comment. And um, especially if you, you find these things useful, uh, definitely like, uh, so that way I know that um, you find it useful. <laughs> um, I'll keep doing these. The next event is going to be, uh, the next published event will be August 12th, where we'll be discussing, let me change my screen here. All right, so the, the next event will be uh, session one of building emergency services teams. So we're going to talk, uh, that's going to be a four part series as well. Uh, that's going to be on August 12th. Uh, currently, August 5th, I do not have anything planned. I'll be at a course. Um, so uh, stand by. What I may do is uh, pre do a, a pre recorded uh, session covering, you know, um, a topic and upload uh, that. If that is a course, uh, that I end up taking, I will upload that link into Teams uh, for everybody and then also add that in uh, to the spreadsheet. So, uh, thank you again, everybody, for joining. And uh, I look forward to seeing uh, more participation and everybody's comments uh, on the video later. <laughs>